We're continuing our studies of Chapter 8, Lipids and Membranes, and in this lesson we want to look at the lipid bilayer and membrane fluidity. The lipid bilayer forms all of our biological membranes, whether it's the outer cellular plasma membrane or the internal compartments. It's a 2D array of amphipathic molecules. It has both a polar and nonpolar region. And that's pictured in the lower right here. The nonpolar tails associate together away from the aqueous interface, and the polar head groups face out towards that aqueous environment on either side of that membrane. Remember, this forms spontaneously because of the hydrophobic effect. We can see more detail if we look at the top of the screen here. Oxygen atoms are in red, phosphorus in green. So we see those phospho head groups are external and facing the water, the blue environment here. The hydrocarbon tails in gray and the final carbon atom in yellow are clearly interacting with one another. So nonpolar regions interacting together, the polar head groups facing out towards that aqueous environment. Another important thing to keep in mind is that this bilayer is not rigid. It's very fluid. So these lipid molecules move quite freely within this environment. There's no defined geometry, even though we often picture it as a rectangle. Hopefully you can see that there's quite a lot of variability in the dimensions as these lipids move. Keep in mind, this membrane, although the lipid molecules within the membrane are very fluid, it's still a self-sealing and stable environment. And this is important. This is what separates inside from outside a cell or compartment. Without the lipid bilayer, we would all be amorphous blobs. This is the only way of keeping inside inside and outside outside. It does pose a problem for us though, and we'll look at that in chapter 9. So the question is, how do we form this self-sealing lipid bilayer? It's formed from glycerophospholipids and single lipids, and this has to do with the geometry of the molecule. Cholesterol can partition in the membrane, but of itself it cannot form a bilayer. So let's do a comparison. If we look at the top of the screen on the far left, we had a, have a fatty acid. So we have the polar head group, and we have a narrow tail, and so the overall geometry is a rectangle, or excuse me, a triangle. If we try to associate that into a rectangular form, it can't be done. Instead, we have gaps. Keep in mind what this means. It would mean that some of our cellular components would leak out and others would leak in. So that won't work. On the far right, we have triacylglycerols. We have the polar head group and three nonpolar tails. And so the overall structure is more or less a trapezoid. Again, we can't set that up as a rectangular array because we have gaps, and so that won't work either. For both glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, we have that polar head and the two nonpolar tails, and that makes the overall geometry a rectangle. Now we can set up a self-sealing barrier that will be very effective in maintaining the integrity of our cells and subcellular compartments. The bilayer is about 25 to 30 angstroms thick, but that can depend on the length of the chain and how they interact with each other, and some of that could depend on the size of the head group as well. Here we have an electron micrograph of cell, and you can see the membrane bilayer indicated by the black arrows there. The measure for membrane fluidity is the melting temperature, or Tm. This is the temperature where we're transitioning from an ordered crystalline state, a more or less solid state, to a fluid state. Keep in mind we have these long hydrocarbon chains that are interacting with each other, acyl chains, so we're talking about hydrophobic interactions, van der Waals interactions. They pack together very tightly in crystalline form, and that's illustrated in our figure in part A here. You can see a very rigid structure, and the dimensions across that bilayer are pretty wide. In the fluid state, in part B, you can see that they're interacting more closely, and it's a more fluid arrangement, and we've diminished the dimensions, the width of that bilayer. So the question is, what influences this melting point, this transition from solid to fluid? 
We have a table here from your book listing several fatty acids and their respective melting points. In this case, in parentheses, the first number tells us the length of the chain, and the second number, after the colon, tells us if there are double bonds and how many. So in the case of laurite, the first of our fatty acids in the table, it's a 12-carbon fatty acid chain, and it has zero or no double bonds. So which fatty acids melt more readily and why? So let's look at our table for those that have the lowest melting point. So those would be linoleate and linoleate indicated by the blue arrows here. They even have negative melting points, which means they're fluid at room temperature. You'll notice that these are 18 carbon chains, but they have a high degree of unsaturation. That is, they're polyunsaturated chains. That means they can't pack together as well, and so they're more easily separated, and that means they melt more readily. Now let's see which fatty acids have the highest melting temperature and why. So in our list here at the bottom, indicated by the red arrows, we have palmitate and stearate. They vary in terms of the length of the chain, but they're both saturated. Look at those melting points, the highest in our list. And so clearly, the longer chain does make a difference. There is a distinction between palmitate and stearate, but the greatest impact has to do with the degree of saturation in the chain. Remember, the more saturated, the more rigid the chain, and the more closely they pack together, that means more van der Waals interactions, harder to separate them, and a higher temperature. So if we compare linoleate, linolinate, and stearate, we'll see they are all 18 carbon compounds, but look how greatly they vary in their melting temperature, and clearly that has only to do with the degree of saturation. So clearly that has the largest impact. Now the lipid melting point does depend on the length of the chain and the degree of saturation, and the saturation does seem to have more of an impact. For a saturated chain though, as the chain length increases, the melting temperature increases. Keep in mind, as we lengthen the chain, we have more van der Waals interactions, making it harder to separate those molecules and increasing the temperature. With regard to unsaturated, remember this means that we have a double bond and we introduce a kink in that chain. And you can see that pretty well in the space filling model on the right. So they can't pack together as well and that lowers the melting temperature. So the longer chains are less mobile than the shorter ones because of more van der Waals interactions. And the saturated are less mobile than the unsaturated because of the degree of packing together more ordered in saturated chain, less ordered in the unsaturated. So we need to be able to maintain our membranes over a range of temperature, that is their fluidity, and we can control that by altering the fatty acid chains, that is the degree of saturation. This is very important in cases for bacteria where they might be exposed to an abnormally low temperature and the tendency would be for their membranes to freeze. Instead, they can incorporate more unsaturated fatty acids in their lipids and that will make their membranes more fluid even at low temperature. Cholesterol also influences fluidity. And we have the structure of cholesterol at the bottom of the screen here. Remember, it's very rigid, a very planar structure, and so that's going to restrict movement. So in the fluid state, it restricts lipid movement and decreases fluidity. However, as we start to pack them together, in the crystalline state, they can't pack as well because cholesterol is interfering, and so it actually increases the fluidity of the crystalline state. So it works more or less like a fluidity buffer, decreasing fluidity in the fluid state, increasing it in the crystalline state. Remember, a very rigid structure, mostly nonpolar, the only polar part of this molecule is that OH group. Another re a factor that may influence membrane fluidity is that there may be local regions that are nearly crystalline. These are referred to as lipid rafts, and I alluded to this early, in an earlier lesson. These contain cholesterol and sphingolipids, as illustrated in our diagram here. 
and they're, they tend to be very rigid structures. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on these lipid rafts, but they are very biologically significant in their normal roles. They also have a role in pathology. Certain pathogens enter our systems by means of these lipid rafts. So again, a very interesting study. In our next lesson, we want to look at the two faces to these lipid bilayers. Are they the same? Do they differ? And how, what does that tell us about the roles of these different lipids?